good to see you all. Um, so Abby and I have been gone for a little while, and we're so happy to be back home and be with um, our family here. We got to go be with our family who uh, needed a little help and care and love, which we got the chance to do. And I'm so happy that you guys took care of Guy while we were gone. Thank you so very much. I know that some of you even um, made him some food, which I do have to tell you, before I left, you said, do we need to feed Guy? And I said, little do you know, he actually is a better cook than I am. However, he is Italian, and food is love. So I re he really appreciated that, and I appreciate that you guys loved on him. And I know that Jenny just went above and beyond while we were gone, and the team was gone to really help out a lot. So we're just so grateful to have that kind of support system and have that kind of church family. Um, a couple of announcements today. So our Good Friday communion service, this will be a stream only service. So you guys get to sit back and relax at home and we will be streaming this to you uh, Friday night, Friday, April 2nd. And during this, you can enjoy a time of communion with your family and get all geared up for coming in on Easter morning celebration with us on Sunday, Easter Sunday. So we're really looking forward to that. Um, another thing, we have some new members that have been asking how to give um, because we don't really drive one another on giving, uh, but we fully trust God's people and we trust our church family that we are doing our best to give our best and what God's showing us to give to the church. But just so that you know, there are two ways to give. There is a box out in the back right there at the end of back of service um, that you can put check-in money into. And then you can also give online if you go to eldoradochurch.org on the giving page. It's really easy. Just click, click click some more. Um, another really exciting thing, our men's ministry, which we are so grateful for, and we're, I'm just so proud of those guys. Um, they are launching a new ministry of helps to service the needs of our community. So it's a helps servicing thing, and we're going to be dealing with different needs in the community and our church family. Um, and for those of you that would love to be a part of that and want to know more about that, you can reach out to Howard, or you can also reach out to Fred, because he is going to be gearing that up and getting that going and leading that, and we're really excited to have that. Such a blessing to have Fred uh, working on that project. So I just want to say thanks for being here. Um, this is going to be a great day, and I am going to pray. My husband's saying pray. I'm going to pray, honey. Um, God, I just thank you for this day and this time, Lord. I thank you that we get to come together in one accord and worship you and honor you. Lord, right now we just lay down all of our cares and our burdens and all the things swimming around in our heads. We just lay them at your feet and say that we are here to be with you, to receive from you, and to hear your word. And we just praise and honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, amen. Welcome, everybody. Good to see you here. Y'all look so bright, shiny faces. Nice to see you. Um, I'm glad you're with us. Um, thanks, sweetheart. Last Sunday, we discussed um, what the scripture means when it says we need to be filled with the Spirit of God. David just sang about it wonderfully. And we talked about as it's illustrated in the gospel, as it's illustrated in the epistles, we talked about what it means to be filled. Coming to the Lord always means coming by the Spirit. The Bible says that no man can come to the Lord lest the Spirit draws him. And so we need to remember that the Holy Spirit is not an it. He's a person, the love of God drawing us to him. Look what it says in John 6, 43. Stop grumbling, it says amongst yourselves, Jesus replied. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. That's what he says. The Spirit draws you. That's how you come to the Lord. And so God himself, I want you to recognize this, loved you so much that he drew you here. He drew you into his presence and told you, hey, I love you. There's no way you could even know how much Jesus loves you without the Spirit. And so it's by the Spirit himself that bears witness that we are his, that we have been chosen. You have been chosen. You have been picked. The word church means called out. You have been picked, saved, chosen, and reconciled to the Father. The whole world wants to tell you who you are. I'm going to tell you today who the Bible says you are. Because all day long, the, the news channels, channels want to tell you who you are. When Abby was little, she'd watch a princess and she'd say, that's me. That's me. Or, or, or some character, that's me. Kids do that. They, they figure out, I think I'll be Barbie instead of, right? So 
we might, on, a, on a subterraneous level, I wonder if we do that. I notice men, when they walk out of an action movie, walk a little, that's me. You know, so it's very important that we know what our identity is. And so Christ um, is, is with us in this life by the Spirit. Christ has ascended to heaven, but he left us his Spirit. Look what Galatians says, talking about the Spirit and human nature. Galatians 5 says, so I tell you, Live by following the Spirit. Then you will not do what your sinful selves want. Our sinful selves want what is against the Spirit, and the Spirit wants what is against our sinful selves. The two are against each other, so you cannot do just what you please. But if the Spirit is leading you, you're not under the law. And then he goes into a list. Brace yourself, modern church. The wrong things... The sinful self does are clear. It says, being sexually unfaithful, not being pure, taking part in sexual sins, worshiping gods, doing witchcraft, hating, making trouble, being jealous, being angry, being selfish, making people angry with each other, causing divisions among people, feeling envy, being drunk, having wild and wasteful parties, and doing other things like that. I warn you, listen, it's okay to party. That word really means orgies, just so you know. He says, don't do that. And doing other things like these, he says, I warn you now, as I warned you before, those who do these things will not inherit God's kingdom. I want to stop there. A lot of people say, well, I got my Christ card. I'm a member now, and so I can keep doing what I want to do. But it says here, people that do that will not come into Christ's kingdom. So I don't really care if you get saved and you have the Holy Spirit, you say, and you can say, she came in a Hyundai, left in a Hyundai. What I care is your life changed. Is your life changed? It's not about gifts, it's about fruit. And gifts are present, but they've never ceased. But my point is, is fruit. And, and look what he says in, in 22. That's, that's the stuff you don't want. And then he says, but, but... The Spirit produces the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law that says these things are wrong. You know what's interesting as I'm reading this scripture? If you were to describe Annie here as, well, I don't know, man. She's, she has a lot of love. She's joyful. She's peaceful. She's patient. She's kind, she's good, she's faithful, she's gentle, she has self-control. I don't think she'd be insulted. But if you did say to her, the thing about her is she worships other gods, she does witchcraft, she causes trouble, she's always angry. You can't be proud of those things. Those are the things you're not proud of. And so it's interesting that if we do what he says, our self-esteem would be much higher. And God is the one that will, that will grow and rot this, not rot, R-O-T, make, W-R-O-U-G-H, he will make in you, he will forge in you these fruit, this fruit of the Spirit. You intend it and you reach for it. One time my little daughter was about somewhere between Eleanor and Penelope's size, and I said, now do something, clean up your room or something, or put that away, and she did this for the first time. Anybody have daughters? Men? She did this, man. And she's so cute, but she stamped her foot at me. And I remember it was the first time I'd I'd ever been angry at her because she hung the moon, right? To this point, she's like five. And I was like, and I felt it. And I was like, wait a minute, this is your baby. And so I just went, Lord, and I actually pictured patience, like sky written, you know, like written in the sky. And I was like, I just swipe my ATM, spiritual ATM card, and I just receive patience now. And I remember the anger just dissipating and I go, come on now. I smiled and she stopped and put everything away. I could have lost it. And don't get me wrong, I have before. But we have it in our account, this fruit. And it's by faith that we accent it, access it. Verse 24 says, those that belong to Christ have crucified, same scripture, their own sinful flesh. They have given up their old selfish feelings and the evil things they wanted to do. So that's our goal. Not, not, not for the sake of behavior, but for the sake of fruit. God wants us to have fruit in this life. That's how we'll be known, and that's how we witness. Um, I don't say it very often. St. Francis gets the credit. But he says, 
I don't think it was, I don't know if it was him who really said it, but he says, preach always, share the gospel always. Only use words when you have to. I think you can use words, but your actions should speak even louder than your words. And so you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, okay? You are not just a flesh bag walking around, slave to your passions any longer. That's my point. God has done in you a great work. Look what he said he was going to do, and he did it. He said in, by the prophet Ezekiel, and I'll give you some examples, but in 36, look what he says in Ezekiel 36, the Old Testament, where he promises this. He says, then, and this is what has happened to each and every one of you that is a born-again believer. He says, then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. Do you know that you are clean? When I was reading that list, did it make you feel heavy? You have been washed you have been clean. He says, I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and bring it about that you will walk in my statutes and are careful to follow my ordinances. Follow my ordinances, thank you. The reason he says that is because you can't do it without a new spirit. We can't just white knuckle this thing and behave the way we're supposed to behave. It says very clearly, I will put a new spirit in you. See, so, so we can't try to perform the Christian life. It has to be something that we are because we recognize and we honor the spirit inside of us. And so you and I, what he's saying there is you, can't, you and I can not only fight the forces of evil and flesh, he's saying you can overcome them by the Spirit because we're more than conquerors. We have the bond of the Spirit that's holding us between the love of God and the love of the Son. No, nothing, nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of God. How many of you heard that before? Look at Romans, that's where you heard it. 8.35 says this. I'm gonna hit you with a lot of scripture today. 8.35, Romans says this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Margaret or Sammy or, no, it says who? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, and this is, this is to describe the condition, the human condition. For your sake, Lord, we face death all day long. We are considered sheep to the slaughter. 37 says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I could just see like a nine-year-old boy like raising his hand or a 90-year-old man. Does that include Corona 13? And he's like, yeah. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor the future nor powers, he's naming a few things that we fear, neither height nor depth, neither anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That feeling in the room that we're feeling now when I read that, that courage that's being infused into us is not because of me. It's because the Holy Spirit is living in you and you're being reminded of the truth of the indwelling spirit that has power within you because the spirit, he holds you. Right now, the spirit is holding you alive and breathing you are within the love of Christ and the Father. Beloved, here's what I'm telling you, that God, by his spirit and his son, has made you ready for it, new creatures. You are new creatures. That's really the name of this talk today. You're a new creature. We are new creatures and you are created for purpose. You have a purpose in this earth. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, says the this right here. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Yeah, but this is the way I am. That's the way you was, okay? Here's what it really says. You are now a new creation. Let me ask you this. Does a butterfly look or act like the worm he once was? Once he's been transformed, does he act like that same worm? Or does he not flash and flutter his glorious wings? 
moving with intention from grace, uh, with grace from pedal to stem to another pedal again and again. He doesn't act like a worm anymore. He can now do this because he can do this without all the crawling and the eating of the dust and the dirt that he was forced to endure in his former state. We are not stuck in that same state. As a mere earthbound caterpillar, he couldn't do that. But now, no more dusty, mud mouth crawling. Now, for him, as for you, he soars on wings and he has been transformed once and for all, just as you have in Christ. For if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. So for us, life in the spirit ought to be rich, ought to be full. What are you telling me all of this, pastor? Is this a pep talk, pastor? No, it's kind of like if Bill Gates was your dad, God forbid he perished, but you didn't realize that he was your dad and you don't go get the inheritance that he's left for you. Well, God has an inheritance for us. And unless we read the fine print, we're going to forget who we are and we're going to walk around like worms. I'm going to give you a few more of what God's love letter, his Bible tells us. He says, being filled with the spirit is a whole experience at regeneration and it is continually available to us. That's what Acts shows us. An ongoing, not just a one-time regeneration, but an ongoing filling. You have to keep filling up your car. Well, we leak too. Following the conversion of the early saints, the ones we read about in our Bible in the New Testament, there is this initial outpouring of the Spirit at the beginning of the birthday of the church in Acts 2. Here's what it says. It says, and they were all filled in Acts 2, 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so we see these devout Christians were praying. They were already Christians and they were praying. 10 days they prayed. And then once again, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. But later we see that wasn't the last time. Two chapters later, in chapter four of Acts, they were filled once again by the Spirit with an empowerment for boldness. So now we're talking about being drawn by the Spirit and saved. We're talking about being filled by the Spirit, receiving gifts. And now we're talking about the third time even, these guys, and it went on and on. I'll show you. Here's what it says in Acts 4. And now, Lord, look upon their threats. What had happened was they were grabbed because they were talking, hey, they went down to the Agora. You know, they went downtown. They went, they went somewhere to a, a, a meeting, perhaps, of dream catchers and hum, humanistic ideas, you know, the new religion. And they were there, and they began talking about Jesus is the way, and Jesus saves, and Jesus loves you. And they grabbed him, and they beat him. And they come back, and they're afraid, and look what happens. They stand there and they're like, what are we going to do? We just got beaten. It's illegal almost to be a Christian. What am I going to do in this hostile culture? I know I'll buy more Doritos and hide and just watch Joyce Meyer every day. I love Joyce, but that's not what they did. Here's what they did instead. They prayed. And now, Lord, look upon their threats, the ones that beat them, and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And here's what it says in verse 31. And when they had prayed, it's a big key there. When they had prayed, the place which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. This is, this is an ongoing filling for every single time they're confronted with a challenge. He gives them what they need. It's like, ever play a video game? Oh my gosh, I'm almost out of energy. What am I going to do? My backpack's empty. Oh, I just... If Nintendo can do it, don't you think the holy God of the universe can fill you for whatever you face? And so this brought about amazing abundance. Look what it says. It says, now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. We're not talking about socialism here. You know what we're talking about? 
We are talking about people taking care of each other. When one person had a need, the other person took care of him. So there was plenty of spirit power to fight the forces. What, what I'm trying to say to you in this moment is that the first Christians had such unity that it enabled them to stand together against the forces of a hostile government, against the forces of an anti-Christ culture. They even prospered in that culture. Th there was a culture that stood opposed to their values, opposed to the God that they cherished, and together they overcame. And guess what? They did such great things in the spirit that they literally carried the torch that they're handing to you today. They overcame trials and they're handing you this torch, friends. They're handing you today the same light. You are the church of the living God, the one he founded here, right in the book of Acts. And we're to carry this torch throughout this county by the spirit. And guess, guess what it says? Just before you, you run away, let me just tell you one thing it says. It says, we're to carry on and do it in even greater ways. Greater ways than Jesus. What? Look at the scripture. Look what Jesus said in John, that we ought to be growing brighter and brighter with each passing generation. He says, very truly, this is Christ talking. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever this is Jesus still talking. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Hmm. Whew. Even greater. I mean, this is Christ talking. Now, you know, it's funny because we see the apostles going around healing, laying hands on people and healing all day long, right? And then they get to this one boy and they can't cast out the demon. They can't heal. They can't do it. And so what they do is they sit down, right? And they write a religion saying, God stopped healing, right? Is that what they did? Did they, did they say, oh, I guess Jesus stopped healing now. So I think I'll just write a religion and I'll explain, well, he heals only who he wants. That is not what the apostles did when they couldn't heal. They went, hey, Jesus. It says they took Jesus aside and they said, why, did, why can't this demon come out? And Jesus said, this one comes out by prayer and fasting. And then Jesus rebuked and the devil came out. Now, does that mean that when you need something, you just fast? Sure, you can do that. But what Jesus was really saying there is I have a lifestyle. I'm fasting and I'm praying into a lifestyle so that when I come across a problem, it's not me, but the power of Christ, I'm sorry, the power of the Holy Spirit through me. If Jesus had to pray, don't we? If Jesus, it, it says Jesus could do no miracles in that one city, Jesus, because there was no faith. So this loophole where you prayed for somebody and it didn't work, don't create a religion around that. Stick with what he says here. Even greater than I have done, you will do. Okay, I don't know what, exactly how that works. I just know he said it. And I think what's the reason we've been going around the mountain for 2,000 years is because we won't take him at his word. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? If Joshua and Caleb said, hey guys, there are grasshoppers in our sight. We can take them. 11 day journey. But because no one would agree with the guys that were telling the truth, no one would take him at their word it took them how long? 40 years in the desert to take an 11 day journey. What if God, what, what if instead of asking, why is the world so getting darker? Is God alive? Is he what if we took him at his word and we let him do the healing? We just do the praying. What if we really challenged ourselves to do that? I wonder how quickly the Lord would come back. Perhaps he's waiting on you and I because we can't do this in the flesh. I know, I get it. I've prayed for people before and they didn't get healed. I get it. But see, I can't do it as the old caterpillar. I have to do it as the new creature. I have to do it as the butterfly. 
because I can't fly to those heights as an, with the old, mind, old earthbound mindset. There was once this girl, I lived in an apartment in Orlando, Florida, and upstairs this woman lived, and I won't say her name, and she had an awful cold. And I had been walking around the lake, that the apartment across the street was a lake, and I would walk around there and just pray and pray and pray and pray. I was a new believer, Larry, so I believed God was a God of miracles. And I was praying, but I had prayed for people and they hadn't gotten healed before. This woman comes down and she's, she's on her way, she actually was on her way to work and she stopped and I saw her put her hand, she goes, I just can't go to work. And I'm coming back from my walk and she's got, you know, snot running down her face. She's got, got a cold, you know, really bad common cold. You know, there is no cure to the common cold yet except Jesus. And I remember because I was kind of out of my mind at the time, Mr. Ron, I was praying. So I didn't realize my limitations. I was feeling very butterfly at this moment. And I saw, I almost said her name. I saw her, let's just pretend her name is Carol, which it isn't. And I said, are you okay? And she's like, she was on the car or whatever she was leaning on. She goes, I just can't go to work. I'm just so sick. And I I need to because my job is a little, uh, it's important. My boss and I are at odds. And I went, oh, and because I was like not thinking about what I couldn't do, I go, here, let me pray for you. I put my hand on her shoulder and I said, in the name of Jesus, cold come out, be healed. I'm telling you, she went, she's like, I can breathe. She just, her whole position changed. She didn't even go inside. She just got her keys, got in the car, drove away. Did I cure the common cold? I don't know. God did something in that moment. The girl looked, her face, her nose wasn't even red anymore. I went to back to my apartment going, what just happened? Like, what just happened? And I felt the Lord speak to my spirit going, you actually let me do something because you got out of the way. I don't know what it is that made me say, well, let me pray for you because we know you can't cure a cold. You just got to put up with it. Well, it worked for Car- Carol and she knows it. And uh, after that, she ended up really uh, chasing me about the Lord. It was awesome. One time I prayed for her again and whatever it was didn't work. She goes, will you pray again? Because that always works. I'm like, sure. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna do imitation of what I did last time, ready? And God was like, really? Because you're not. there's no faith here. So all I'm saying is try it. Try praying. Try praying and watch what God does. Okay, I wanna be real respectful here. This is some deep lofty stuff, pastor. You're asking us miracles. You're asking us to do things we haven't done. I have been believing the same way, Pastor, for 10, 20, 30, 40, 60 years, and my mind's pretty made up. Yep, I just can't let any new thought in there. I understand that. You see, Pastor, I, I know what I, I've been doing this for years, and I know what it says here. But, 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 but Pastor, hold your butt. Hold your butts for just a minute. Because I want to show you what the word says in Hebrews 4, 412. And this is one of my favorite scriptures. It says this, for the word of God, that's what I'm reading to you, where Jesus says you'll do even more. The word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrows, And what that means is, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. He's saying, I ain't done with you yet. I want to get my two-edged sword guy into your heart. And I want to separate where you you don't trust me, where you're afraid to step. I want you to let me put my word in you. And I want it to change you. No matter how old you are, there's more in me. This is what he's telling us. And I believe we ought to pray right now. Lord, Lord. And I'll just do it for you. Lord, I pray you put our sword to our soul. I didn't ask for this today. I came for a pep talk, Lord, and here's this pastor. But I pray you put a sword in my soul. Pierce any thoughts, Lord, any intentions that you want, Father. I give you my heart. Fill me with your spirit. Expand my vision of what you can do in these end times. I don't come to church just to hear my favorite old greatest hits, Lord that make me comfortable. No, I come here to grow, Jesus. I trust you. I want you to heal my soul, Lord. My heart, my mind, Lord Jesus, even if it takes holy surgery, take out some pain, put in some faith, God. Make me brand new again. Get the worm out of me. 
and let me be the butterfly I'm born to be. Father, I receive your living and active word. I want your thoughts. I want to know you more. Amen. Luke 24 says this, you are my witnesses, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power on high. Do you realize clothed with power on high. He says, shake off these old earthly clothes. Well, that's just the way I am. Okay, put on my spirit, he says. And what he's saying is God will supply to us all the power that we need for this expanding witness of Christ. It isn't about us. It's about the people he wants to save through you. But he'll bring you joy as you do that. He'll bring you joy as your prayers are answered. We saw in Acts 22, 4, he, he says that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me read you some more quickly. He says this, then Peter in Acts 4, 8, and you won't see these on the screen, so I won't waste your time, but you can look them up and scribble down the addresses. Acts 4, 8 says, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, spoke to the rulers of the people, and they saw the boldness with which he spoke. Acts 4, 31, and when they had prayed, in the, that place in which they were gathered, they were shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke with boldness. Acts 6 says, Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. By the way, Stephen wasn't one of the 12 apostles, right? So, so Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit and faith and the Jews could not withstand the wisdom with which he spoke. In other words, they couldn't out talk him. They could ha- couldn't even handle it. Acts 7 says, Stephen, filled with the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing there. Acts 11, Barnabas was full, Barnabas was full of the Spirit and faith, and a large company was added to the Lord. Acts 13, Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 3.16 says this, and it's a prayer for all Christians. According to the, to the riches of His glory, that he might grant you to be strengthened. Okay, the reason he says his glory is because if you watch too much TV, you can start to feel very small because you realize everybody else has so much better than you. They're, they're prettier, they're faster, they're more handsome, they have more. You just start shrinking. And so it's hard for me to tell you how great you are, so I'm not gonna waste that. I'm gonna tell you how great he is. And so is Paul. According to the riches of his glory... He may grant you to be empowered with might through his spirit. Well, how's he going to get it to me? In your inner man, that you would be filled with all the fullness of God. Brothers and sisters, do you see what I'm saying? What is available to you and what is available to everyone who seeks him? That's what he's talking about. Those that hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled with all the fullness of God. What do you mean hunger and thirst? That's just what this fasting thing means. Food is good for us. We have to eat. We have to drink. So there's nothing wrong with your regular hungers. The problem is they get so amplified in our daily life that we shut out the deeper hungers, the hunger for righteousness that you actually have. And that's why you want another bag of Doritos, the extra bag the extra pint of ice cream, the extra whatever, because you're you're feeding this, which is good, but you're forgetting this. And that's why we fast, so we can shut down the loudness of the regular hungers to hunger for righteousness, to thirst to be fulfilled. And we tend to push in, we tend to pray only enough to just ease our conscience but not enough to make a difference. The Lord could be urging you. He could be moving you. This will hit home. Uh, uh, He's saying, I want you to pray for the country. I want you to pray for the government. And you you feel this urging. You know, it, it may feel like anger at CNN or Fox or Newsmax or whichever one you hate. And you start to, so what do you do? You drop to your knees and pray for the nation. No, we've got these pressure valves. We've got these release valves like where we can, like social media and dinner parties where we can vent and criticize these politicians. And then we sort of release a little pressure. We never really pray. And and what happens is our conscience is relieved enough to remove the burden, but we never pray 
what God's putting on our heart. That's a God-given urge. That's a God-given anger you have. And instead of dropping to your knees and praying, Father, touch Senator Dr. Seuss. Touch, you know, whatever it is, you know, there's, there's something we can do to shift our environment. It's called pray by the Spirit. And what I'm trying to get across is that I find myself wasting the authority that I have in prayer. I mean, God didn't just put the Holy Spirit in me to hang out. He put the Holy Spirit in you and I to give us authority to call heaven to earth. And when you pray, I, I just want to clear a couple of things up. When you pray, you're not convincing God. We pray in order to break down the, de the demonic static and the strongholds that war against God's intention for the earth. See, that's our privilege as chosen ones. I told you you have a purpose. We're ambassadors. You're an ambassador of another world. And we're emissaries of his kingdom. We're devoted, if we're devoted to see his land healed and his purpose among the earth, boy, it'll give you some, some power. I was just praying, I was just thinking and praying last night and I was thinking about my 20s, just how much it was about me. And we had some fun, didn't we all, in our 20s? But did we help anybody? Did we change anything? What if the real life you're looking for is in shifting the atmosphere over a city, over a country, and all God's waiting for is for you to access the investment of Him, His Holy Spirit living in you by praying holy prayers? You'll see in the Bible the greatest things that happened always followed prayer. Always. Authority that you have in your life right now is waiting to be activated. And here's what authority comes from. Two things. Authority comes from intimacy with the Lord, closeness with the Lord, and it also comes, it also comes with dependency on his spirit. That's why I'm going to say over and over again, this is no pep talk. There's nothing you can do in your own flesh, but by the spirit, you can tell your flesh what to do, just like you tell a puppy, get off the couch. So I'm doing that all the time now with this new puppy. You get to tell your flesh what to do. And now God has an emissary in the earth to do his. Do you know how powerful you really are? You can change things with your prayer. If we engage heaven with prayer, God will engage this earth with his power. He's waiting on us. Verse 21, how does it happen? God says, by the power at work within us, Mark, that we are able to do far more abundantly, he says in verse 21, than we may even ask or think. I'm saying we have extraordinary power in us as believers. I'm, I'm really glad because I would hate to limit God, the Lord of the universe, by my old stinking thinking. Because if it's just up to me, I won't do much. But this enabling power comes from the Spirit. And the Bible says it's the very fullness of God, as fantastic as that sounds. Philippians says this, everything that we deal with, God wills to give us and equip us what we need, what we need to face what we're dealing with. You lose somebody you love, he will empower you by comforting you. You have to take a hill in your job. You, you, whatever it is, God will equip you. Look what he says. And my God will supply all your need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And so, beloved, the purpose of this talk this morning is to awaken each and every one of you to the sufficiency and the abundance of the richness of our life in the Spirit. Now, you may not know what that means, but I say lead into it. Start dealing with your problems as a new creature as a new creature, remade for his purpose. It's not something I made up, it's right in his word. And I know we haven't arrived yet. I get it, saints. But we're no longer just mere worms squirming in the muck. No, you and I, you are brand new. You are brand new, lofty saints, made afresh. You are regenerated. You're washed in his blood. Your sins are gone. You've been cleansed by his spirit and you've been empowered for mission. You're clothed in his righteousness. 
And this new life is for every believer who says yes to the more of God. Not the same old drudgery, but the more that God is promising us. And the reason I'm pushing you is because this season of Lent, do you know that's the name of the season before Easter? It's called Lent. And it's this time where we're supposed to up our resolve in prayer, in fasting, fasting the earthly things to quiet them down, to lift up the spiritual things. We're supposed to up our resolve in prayer, in fasting, and in giving, generosity. Resurrection day is almost here. Do you know that? Have you been pushing into God or just coasting these last few weeks? I mean, we ought to be saluting because every other state in the union has ripped their masks off and are having beach parties. We're getting there. We're coming out of this thing. And I want you to understand something. Resurrection Day is here. And if you've fallen behind in your giving, if you've fallen behind in your prayer, just trust God. Push in because he's not upset with you. But I would hate for you to get to Easter and not have something new to be proud of. Because what shows him that he's number one in your life is your generosity, it's your prayers, it's putting him first. And if you've let your prayers dwindle down to a mere uh, rub-a-dub-dub, thank you for the grub, or now I'll lay me down to sleep, I think you can do more. And, and so if your mind's been preoccupied with the junk food chatter of so- social media, push into the deeper hunger, put the phone down, Turn off the TV and say a prayer. Saints, I want you to use this time before Easter because you still got plenty of time to refocus because the Bible says, seek God while he is near. This is a time when God is close. He happens to be living inside of you. And so use this time to refocus your mind on God. Don't, we ought to not, what is it? Don't just glance at God and gaze at our problems. We ought to glance at our problems and gaze upon God. That's what will shift things. So in every area of your life, gratitude and blessing, showing God he's number one, that'll fill you this Easter season. And so I've just got a few things I want to tell you. Here's just points. Drench yourself with God's word. Drench yourself in the living scriptures. Worship God. Remember, generosity brings blessing. Do everything unto the Lord as though he's right there watching, as though he's actually part of your life. Become mindful of the spirit of God in every moment. If I had, well, let's just say a dove. I was gonna say a parrot, but I'm not a pirate. If I had a dove on my shoulder, how would I walk? How would I, wouldn't I walk conscious? So, so let's, let's speak, the, the Holy Spirit's a person, not a dove, But let's be conscious, not of the symbol of the Holy Spirit, but the presence of him in every conversation we're having. We're not the underdog because we have all of heaven behind us. Yeah, but I don't know what to say all the time. Well, it says in the Bible, ask and he will give you wisdom. Now see, we're not using the power he's given us. Lastly, just pray. Use your God-given authority to change your personal and political climate. Change your personal world, but change the climate around you. Pray to change. I I think you should vote. I think you should protest if that's what you want to do peacefully. But don't forget, don't, don't fall for the political spirit baloney. This is a God thing. Pray. 62, I don't want to say Pray for life. Pray for the members of this church. Pray that this will be a lighthouse, this church, the future of this church. We will be a lighthouse to this 285 corridor. We're beginning to expand in all kinds of ways. We met with some real estate folks. We are ready to join our hearts together to be a light. And so um, as I wrap up, I want to just throw this reminder out there because it's what I've been saying all morning. You're a new creature who is co-laboring with God. This isn't a passive relationship. You are co-laboring with God to shift the atmosphere over your family, over your house, over your physiology. You can pray for yourself. Shift the atmosphere over our culture, over our city, over our nation. What can one man do? Well, the prayer of one righteous man availeth much. 
the Bible says. So when we pray, we're not trying to sway God. We're not trying to dis, we're just not trying to, to con God or to get God on our side. God's on your side. Are you on his side? So here's what I'm saying. When we pray, we're not trying to sway God. Do you understand that? We're trying to dispossess, and we are when we pray, the darkness that is entrenched in the area that we are pushing into. And it's this process of praying. God wants us to pray for the sake of us breaking through the demonic thing and even making us stronger so that when he gives you the answer to prayer, you now have the muscles and the, and the, and the responsibility, the character to steward what he's given you. Prayer isn't wasteful. God's not cruel. He doesn't say, hey, go ahead and pray, but ain't nothing's gonna happen till I come back. That would be really weird, wouldn't it? God doesn't give you an assignment like that. He gives you an assignment so that you can have prayer answered and you can have the fullness of joy. He wants to answer your prayers. Prayers change us. And so look at this. John 15 says this. By this, my father is glorified. That you bear much fruit. Do you have John 15, 8? By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. Some of what I have to do in Santa Fe is break down the religious mindset that says, I, I, I just whipping yourself, good to suffer for God. I can't expect to receive answers to my prayer. I can't expect to, it says right here, it's glorified when you bear much fruit. Forget not his benefits. God wants to answer your prayers. I just want you to imagine that God is glorified, like it says here, when we abide in him. Let me end with this example I recently heard. Visualize this before, day, before we close with the music. Imagine that you're steeped in concern for someone you care about, a friend, a relative, and, and you don't know why, you're, you're pacing the floor, you're praying day upon day over the situation, and suddenly you get this phone call letting you know that this relative was saved, she was healed, she was delivered from danger, your prayers were answered. What you don't see is the angels rejoicing behind the scenes, the angels that have witnessed the whole interaction. See, they just witnessed you, this new creature who's been born again, who's been filled with the Spirit, shaped by God, and you, you, you chose to yield yourself and go in prayer to the courts of heaven. See, they, they witnessed all this. And they saw you interact with the throne of grace. Lord, hear my prayer about so-and-so. And they saw you come before the King of Kings and make a request from a holy God that actually was answered. And you, you and I, you, when you did this, you shaped the course of history. And the angels just say out loud, it worked. It worked, God. Your plan worked. You created them in your image. And then even after they fell, Lord, you, you came to earth and restored them. You brought them into that place of co-laboring with you. I mean, they were once fallen, but now they're redeemed. And these new creatures, God, that you redeemed, they prayed. You acted. And things changed. It worked. Holy, holy are you, Lord. You were right, Lord. It works. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. Let's pray. Father, it works. When we do what you say, it works. And we can no longer afford to be unaware of this great reality. And that is that the Holy Spirit dwells in me. We're created anew. We're endowed with your purpose and your power. Father, we commit to pursue you in prayer, in devotion, in every area, in generosity and service to one another. God, we invite you to awaken us. Let us pray now as the band sings. I want those that want prayer, you're welcome to come get some. But I want you just to be there and to know that God is healing you. He's doing holy surgery in whatever area you need.
And the takeaway for today, God, put this in our hearts, is that we have your spirit to affect this world and don't let anybody tell you different. God, I ask you to seal that. I ask you to make that abundantly clear and to fill us again, Lord. We need more of you. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in today. If you are blessed by this message at all, then be a blessing and give to the work of the Lord at eldoradochurch.org.